All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning a welcome back, please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A physics tutor wants to improve the habits of one of their tutoring students, so they observe the student during a 90-minute lecture. The physics tutor experiences frequent interruptions during the lecture and is unsure if the data he collected is usable. What might you recommend the tutor use if frequent interruptions are expected? So we have a measurement question, and a pretty common problem in measurement is when you don't have enough time or if you aren't able to constantly observe the behavior of interest. And this is especially true if you're working with multiple kids at once or you're very busy. So if that's the case, what might we recommend the tutor use if they're going to have frequent interruptions? Because they want to observe their tutoring student, but they just aren't sure if the data they're currently collecting is usable. What's the best alternative here? A, event recording. Event recording is continuous. So you're still, the tutor is still going to have to observe every instance of behavior. And given what we know about interruptions and the data, event recording might not be the best option. Then we have our discontinuous measurements, which are probably better options. We have whole interval, partial interval, and momentary time sampling. Whole interval and partial interval are going to be better, but even then, during that sample of time, during those intervals, you have to observe the student or the tutoring student the entire time. And so if it really is an issue where we are experiencing interruptions to the point that data is not usable, then you're likely going to want to recommend momentary time sampling. There, with momentary time sampling, this way the tutor does not have to observe the whole time, just for split seconds at the end of each interval. Remember, you always want to choose the measurement procedure that is not only going to help you accomplish your goals and track data the best, but that is most feasible giving environmental constraints. A steakhouse offers a special that allows customers to pick their own cut of meat. Customers walk through a meat locker and select from a variety of different steaks and pick their favorite. What preference assessment does this resemble? Now with every preference assessment question, the first question we wanna ask, how many stimuli are we assessing? If it's one, we're thinking single choice. If it's two, we're thinking pair choice. If it's three or more, we're thinking multiple stimulus with or without replacement. In this case, we have a situation where customers are just told to go pick your favorite. And they walk through a meat locker and pick from a large variety. No direction, no instruction. They're just told to pick their favorite. So that's going to most resemble a D, a free operant assessment. Free operant is much more child-led, or in this case, learner-led, customer-led, right? We're not giving instruction. We're not giving a lot of direction. We're just observing and seeing what they pick. Customers here are not given any specific choices or specific instruction. They're just said, go pick your favorite, and they do. So it most resembles a free operant assessment. A graphics designer wants to see if design A or design B is more effective at getting customers to add items to their cart online. The designer alternates between A and B online while collecting data and graphing the data. After several days, it is clear that design B leads to more items added to the cart. What dimension is represented by the designer's behavior? Okay, so we had several assumption questions last video. And so we're going to take the same approach with our dimension questions. We're going to be very precise and specific about what is being asked. In this case, we're looking at the designer's behavior. The designer is doing what? Well, they want to see if design A or design B is more effective at getting customers to add items. So what do they do? They set up an experiment. They're alternating between A and B, collecting data. And then after a while, it's clear design B is more effective. What has this graphic designer done as far as dimensions go? A, applied. Applied means we're picking things that are socially meaningful. And this is going to apply to like our target behaviors and goals that we choose. Applied isn't necessarily the designer's behavior here, right? Because they're trying to choose the better design. 
It's not necessarily applied. What they're doing though is very analytic. They're establishing experiments to demonstrate experimental control and functional relationships. And they have established a functional relationship between design B and Adam's Ida Descartes. It's a very anal analytic approach from the designer. C, effective. Well, we don't know if it's effective yet, right? They, they've chosen B as the better alternative than A, but we're not sure about the effectiveness quite yet. We just know B is better than A. We don't know how much better or how effective. And then D, conceptually systematic. There are no mentions of ABA principles or technologies, so we're not sure if the graphic designer is conceptually systematic or not. What is most apparent and what is obvious is the graphic designer was very analytic. They established this experiment and they demonstrated some sort of functional relationship between design B and items added to cart. John is speaking with a group of technicians as part of a monthly meeting. John is discussing the importance of social validity when choosing behavior targets and the meaningfulness of change when measuring behavior outcomes in the field. John is likely discussing what? All right, so let's think about John here, right? What is John's role in all of this? Well, she's speaking with technicians as part of a monthly meeting, and she's talking about social validity, validity for behavior targets and the meaningfulness of change when measuring behavior. So this is very much related to what? Well, it's very much related to the practice of ABA, right? If we think about A, behaviorism, this has to do with our theories, things like radical radical and methodological behaviorism. Jean isn't speaking in theory. These are very much applied concepts that these technicians should use in practice. If we think of B and C, experimental analysis of behavior, and C, applied behavior analysis, both involve experiments, right? Experimental analysis of behavior is more animal related, where applied behavior analysis is related to humans. What Jean is doing is thinking about practice, right? How can her technicians do better? How can she train her technicians to more effectively implement ABA designs in practice? So Jean is most likely discussing practice guided by behavior analysis. Amy is competing in the 200 meter hurdles event. At practice, Amy is the fastest girl on her team and easily clears each hurdle on her way to the finish line. Yesterday, Amy hit a hurdle during her competition, which caused her to come in third place instead of first. What failed to happen? So Amy failed at something. And what was that? Well, what do we know? What does the question give us? Notice we never jump to the answer choices. We're always attacking the question because you want to attack the question. You can even make a prediction. And then we get to the answer choices. Amy is competing in a hurdles event. During practice, Amy clears each hurdle. Now, Amy, during competition, hits a hurdle. What has Amy failed to do? Well, if the hurdle is the stimulus, right, and she needs to engage in the response of jumping over that hurdle in the presence of that stimulus, what has she failed to do? Well, she's failed to generalize, right? She's failed to generalize jumping over the hurdle. She can do it in practice, but... Stimulus, competition, no generalization. So if we look at A, response generalization, it's not about changing the responses. Amy needs to just engage in the same response, but in the presence of different stimuli. Amy failed to do that. Response differentiation. Again, Amy's not changing the response. In practice, she gets every hurdle. Her problem is she is not generalizing to competition, meaning she can't engage in the same response in the presence of the hurdles when it matters. So what failed to happen? Stimulus generalization. Rick has had enough of his job and decides he is quitting tomorrow. Rick does like his coworkers. So since Rick manages so many processes, he spends the day writing step-by-step -step instructions for each process in a way that his coworkers can understand. Rick is being what? Whenever we get a question like this, you know, we're looking at Rick's behavior and Rick is doing what? Well, he's writing step-by-step -step instructions for processes that his coworkers can understand. So whenever we're thinking step-by-step -step instructions, I first think of task analyses. But task analyses is not an answer choice, right? An answer choice has to do with our dimensions. So let's switch gears here. Notice 
I tackled the question, made a prediction, and then the answer choice guided me in a different direction. So now I've already got the knowledge of what Rick has done. He's wrote step-by-step -step instructions so that all his coworkers can understand the processes. Rick is being a technological. Technological says we're writing things and designing things in a way that is repeatable. Now, this is a very applied question, so it might not be a one-to-one -one fit, but it is still the best example of being technological. He's writing it in a way that his coworkers can understand. Be effective. We don't know if it's effective or not. Rick's attempting to be effective, but we're not sure if it's effective. Analytical. Rick isn't establishing a functional relationship here. There's no experiment going on. And generalizable. We don't know if it's going to be generalizable or not to whatever Rick needs to be done, or if it even needs to be generalized. Maybe this is just specific to his work. We do know, however, Rick is writing in a way that is replicable, that these coworkers can understand. He's being technological. A trainer is teaching a client to use a treadmill. Initially, the trainer verbally prompts each action, such as now press start. As the client becomes more familiar, the trainer waits a few seconds before verbally prompting to allow the client a chance to respond independently. What procedure is the trainer specifically using? So we're looking at the trainer's behavior. It's a procedure question. So what do we know about the trainer? What is the trainer attempting? Well, the trainer is teaching the client how to use a treadmill, and they're using prompts. So initially, they're verbally prompting every action. So very heavy use of prompts. Eventually, the trainer starts to wait a few seconds before prompting. So what do we call it when we go from prompting immediately to waiting to prompt? Well, we call it A, a prompt delay. The trainer is simply using a prompt delay. Instead of prompting immediately, they're going to give the learner a chance to respond. A chain with a limited hold has to do with the behavior chain, where in between steps is a certain amount of time you have to complete the next step. Not necessarily the case here. It's a prompting question. A stimulus fading. They are fading out the prompts slowly, right? But we need the specific procedure, and that is a prompt delay. So we want to be very specific here because the question said specifically. Prompt delay, we are trying to fade out the prompts, but specifically a prompt delay is being used. And then least to most prompting, well, we don't really know because we're only using the same prompt over and over again. So it's not necessarily going least to most or most to least. We're just looking at a verbal prompt, specifically the idea of delaying that prompt, give the client a chance to respond independently. An analyst is observing a client's behavior during a structured play session. The analyst takes detailed notes on the frequency and duration of specific problem behaviors, noting that the client engages in hand flapping seven times over the 30-minute session. What goal of behavior analysis is the analyst demonstrating by collecting and recording this information? So our goals question, our goals are what? We have prediction, description, control, or description, prediction, control. Description is simply describing what happens. So in this case, analyst takes notes on problem behaviors and then says the, the client did this. So they are just describing the client engaged in hand flapping seven times. Prediction is drawing a correlation or making a hypothesis. The client engaged in hand flapping because. There is no because. There is no prediction. Control is when we actually establish a functional relationship through experimentation, which hasn't happened. All the analyst has done is described the behavior of the client. So the goal here is description. Which of the following scenarios demonstrates effectiveness to the largest extent? What does it mean to be effective in ABA? Because we can make change that isn't effective. Effective means we want to make a meaningful change. Goals that matter, right? Some clients going from one to two is a huge deal. Some clients going from one to two means nothing. It's all based on the client and their needs. We want to be effective. Change that matters. So let's look at A. Is it effective? Functional communication occurs twice as much two weeks after an intervention begins. Okay, that could mean one to two. That could mean 50 to 100. A does seem to be effective because there's change, but 
Is there something more specific? B, a new reinforcement system is embraced by students, but no noticeable behavior change takes place. B is obviously not effective. Nothing changed. C, a goal of 10 independent transitions per day was set, but a visual schedule leads to almost 20 independent transitions per day. C is better than A. Why? Well, C, we have a set goal and we far exceeded that goal. That's what it means to be effective. Twice as much means nothing without raw data and numbers. Setting a goal of 10 and getting to 20 is huge. That's extremely effective. D, a staff training program leads to more engagement from staff for a week, but then the behavior returns to baseline levels. Temporary change is not as effective as permanent change. The most effective here is C. We set a goal and then we doubled that goal. Turk can always tell when Carla is annoyed because she will either roll her eyes, cross her arms, or tell him that nothing is wrong. Although these things don't always happen simultaneously, Turk still knows something is wrong. These behaviors together are considered what? So we have a group of behaviors, and we have a group of behaviors, a group of behaviors or a group of responses. That is a class, right? And so we have rolling eyes, crossing arms, telling them nothing is wrong. Now, all these responses have the same effect, right? It indicates Carla's annoyed or let's Turk know something is wrong. So these behaviors together, that they serve the same purpose or what? A, a response. Well, each one is an individual response, but we're looking at them all together. So all of them together is going to be considered a response class. They're not stimuli, so it can't be a stimulus or a stimulus class. Straightforward question. Don't overthink it. Trust your preparation. Answer it. We move on. All right. Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.